Hi, I'm Thomas Kotcheff, your host for this year's 2017 Ojai Music Festival online broadcast. And for those of you, of you who know the festival, know that a big feature is these early morning and late night concerts. The shows here go from the break of dawn to literally midnight. And um, I'm very, very happy and lucky to be sitting next to Jen Chu, who this morning did the 9 a.m. morning concert. A feature that's been in the last few years of Ojai is these multidisciplinary artists who are composers, who are performers, and just have many hats on and do many things brilliantly, and this is no exception right here. Jazz vocalist, composer, dancer, opera, ballet, violin, you name it, she's done it, and I'm so happy to have you. <laughs> I like in your notes, this is many hats. <laughs> <laughs> Literally many hats. So maybe we can start off by just talking about your background and, and how you got okay. all these hats on. Well, it's a combination of wonderful parents um, kind of just letting me uh, do what I want, but also exposing me to things um, and, and, and just this passion for it right away. So I feel like I've been very lucky to never question what I was going to do um, in my life. So, uh, and also the many hats comes from uh, obsessions mm -hmm. and insatiable curiosity mm -hmm. and kind of greediness <laughs> of wanting to learn everything and do everything. Um, but I think uh, maybe the root of it comes from just wanting to express more uh, kind of representing maybe you could say my people, my generation, my uh, gender, wanting to express more than what I see out there mm -hmm. uh, in the world, in the media. And um, so, so it's, you know, so it's kind of uh, also, I, I don't like categories and I don't like labels, so I'm always just trying to dodge those. And not, not just for the sake of dodging, but I just feel like once you get trapped in a label or a box, that it's so limiting. And, and usually it's, it's other people who, mm -hmm. who try to do that. It, I mean, of course, they, they have to in a way as presenters or as writers or as critics. Um, but as an artist, if you let that invade your vision, it, it can be maybe detrimental to your creativity. So I try and um, not let that happen, although it's, it's, it's always a challenge, but um, yeah. Yeah, I think so. this, this whole year has been like a testament to that and every concert, every artist here yeah. is defining what genre isn't, you know? Yes. <laughs> and I mean, right. specifically, Vijay says he wants to replace the word genre with mm -hmm. community. Mm. What does that mean to you? It's very good. Yes, I mean, I, I think it's, we are, we're just an, an accumulation of who we interact with, who we look up to, who our mentors are, um, you know, so it was so emotional last night with Wadada. Mm. Um, oh no, ah, I thought I was done crying for the day, but, uh, but he's, he's been such an amazing mentor, and Roscoe who's coming, yep. and Muhal, you know, it's, um, it's like these giants, you know, that we're lucky to have interaction with. And um, so, you know, imagine meeting Bach, you know, or Stravinsky. And um, so just to have this direct contact is something you, you have to value. Absolutely. And uh, so, so Vijay is completely correct that it is about who you, you are aligned with. At a certain point, and sometimes you you are in alignment, and then you move away. That's something Steve Coleman always talked about. Um, but everything is like a collection. You're just a collection of all these influences, and including your parents, their parents, their parents' parents, you know. Mm -hmm. And then uh, and then just radiating out from there. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that answered. Your question. Absolutely, no, absolutely. <laughs> so, so for your formal training, you began in classical. Yes. Moved to jazz. Mm. Moved to <laughs> folk, and then now it's it's all in one, all together. Is that about right? Yeah, it's um. So it is communities in a way, but um, and then it's it is, for me, it's kind of trying to. I want to keep everything. Mm -hmm. So that's another reason why I just have so many hats. I don't want to. It's not like I'm moving through and I'm done with that. It's like I'm just adding 
like adding to the big bag. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, so, and, and also it's a seeking, like Muhal always talked about seeking. And, 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 and then you know, we change so much. So for me as an artist, you know, uh, often when you're building a career, it can be easy to fall into uh, becoming what what uh, is marketable, you know. Mm -hmm. But but um, luckily, my mentors have always been, you know, they've ingrained in me to to just you have to stay on your path, and and that evolves, you know. So let it change and let it, um, you know, grow and not get stuck. Absolutely. So. Um, yeah, so I'm so lucky to have gotten that wisdom. You know, Steve was always so, just watching him operate and be inside of his music, that was a huge influence, and still is, you know, so. So this morning's 9 a.m. performance, which we're mm -hmm. about to stream in about 20 minutes, um, <laughs> is a culmination of basically your life, in a right. way, and everything right. that you've come from, and yeah. um, Seven Rights, Solo rights. Solo rights, seven, seven breaths. breaths. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe you can just start by introducing a little bit and we can get yes. into it and start, you know, opening Absolutely. it up. I know there's a lot to talk about and a lot to say lot. about this monumental yes. project, but maybe you can start. Um, well, the director was a major piece of the bringing together of the work. And so his name's Garin Nugroho, and uh, he's an Indonesian filmmaker and stage director. And he's phenomenal and so productive and just in, inspiring all around, um, especially, well, not especially, there's so many especialies with him, but, um, but he galvanizes communities and it, he just, like, burukumpul, like, he can just gather people together and just, like, artists of the highest degree. And so when I went to Indonesia, um, I saw a film of his before and I had gotten a Fulbright to study uh, Sindenan, which is the Javanese soft singing uh, tradition of with gamelan that goes with mm -hmm. gamelan. So I got, received this Fulbright with ha having no background in gamelan, but but luckily they loved my proposal as, as well, I'm an improvising singer, vocalist, composer, looking to go deep into another vocal improvisational tradition. So they they liked it. And I <laughs> so they okay, I'm going on this Fulbright and um and a friend of mine named Jessica Kenny, who's a, another great vocalist, um a great vocalist, I should say another that <laughs> makes me sound anyway. Uh I love you Jessica. And uh, but she said you should check out this movie called Opera Jawa by directed by Gary Nugroho. So I watched it and I thought wow, I have to meet this person because it was this perfect marriage of tradition and uh, contemporary art, art installation, all the things that I love, you know, and also I'm trying to marry um, mm -hmm. in my own work. So <gasps> I kind of, I didn't stalk him, but I, <laughs> I was given contacts mm -hmm. that just led me straight to him, <laughs> which is, wow, you know, it's uh, very lucky. So Rachel Cooper kind of led that path um, from Asia. She's a, uh, how do I say, director of programming, arts programming in, at Asia Society. So through her and through other artists, um, I, I was able to meet Garin. And, and then it's amazing in Indonesia because it's so down to earth there. Artists are, there's no uh, like entourage like they have here it was just like a direct mm -hmm. contact and I just gave him my albums sent him links and I said you know I'm during this time here in Indonesia I I, I will be building a solo piece I was like just projecting like yes I'm looking for a director for my solo piece <laughs> I love it. very uh pr presumptuous but uh -huh. but you know as an artist I, I've learned you have to kind of just go for it and be courageous and um and so he like looked, listened to the CDs and um, the album. And he said he sent me an email like, um, "I would be very happy to work with you." I'm like, wow. what? And, um, so then, for the next two years that I was there, we just kept in touch and we did little collaborations. Um, and and I and it just through that long process, uh, and then a, a commission from uh, Roulette in New York. Mm -hmm. 
through that, and, and then that was an opportunity to invite him to New York and, and then to create this new piece. You know, it was all stuff I kind of was terrified about, like, because I thought, oh, he's such a high level, and I'm like a nobody, and, um, and then, but he was so amazing to work with, and, and, uh, and so he, he built, he kind of just, with a notepad, you know, we met in, in my, at my house that I was renting in, in Solo, he said, well, I have this framework, and we, I think it should be seven, in seven parts. I said, oh, how about seven breaths? And it just, like, came together. And then, uh, and so the structure, the original structure that he intuited became the structure of the piece. So it was like this, this leaving from East Timor, going to Java, going through Taiwan and Vietnam, Korea, Kalimantan from Indonesia, and then back to East Timor, and then, and then to this anonymous, I call world, uh, uh, anonymous world, where it's like we just try to strip away all of the externals and we just get to the human level because we're all human. As I said this morning, so we're all the same inside. Absolutely. So, you know, and because so, I, I sing in a lot of languages, and I just told them, you know, just put the program book down. You actually understand what I'm singing. Wow. You know. Maybe we can talk yeah. about that right now, just um, just about language and about yeah. text, because there's going right. to be no translations ah. for the viewers. There's going to be nothing for them to in contact with. What do you? There are some sources that I can lead them to. Uh, if you do a search for Solo Write Seven Breaths and Asia Society, you can find a PDF of oh, the cool. English translations, at least. But not if you want the original language and English, then my album Sounds and Cries of the World has the booklet with photos from my field work along with those translations. So those are sources. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I love to encourage people to just take it in because inside the piece I do translate a lot within oh, the I songs. Mm -hmm. Like I have a, often I compose it within. The text is by you. Some of it, mm -hmm. half of it. Okay. Um, but a lot of it is text from mentors, um, from poet friends, from traditional pieces. So it's it's like a a collection, like yes. <laughs> as I mentioned before. So um, and each world represent it's it's autobiographical, but I I really mean it to be a universal monologue through the eyes of a woman traveling alone, and um, you know, and it just kind of the the things you encounter, the challenges you encounter as being that woman traveling alone. And yeah. um, so it's very personal. And there's uh, uh, one of the pieces in there actually is by a, an artist who passed away. Oh, let's see, January of 2014. Okay. Islamet Gundono. And he was a Dalang of amazing vision and... Um, and he, we actually did a song together. Like he, this, oh, I'll never forget. It was at his house and he just taught me one of his poems line by line. And we just improvised. And at that time, my Indonesian was, I was still learning, you know. So he would like, just learn, lear, you know, he taught me one line, like, aku yang lahir dari air mata. I was like barely hanging on. But it, it means like I was born from a tear. Wow. And, and he would feed me each line. I'd have to memorize it, and and then I had my lute, and he, you know, and he's this master. He, he had his own instrument, and I was terrified. And but then we created this song, and together, and um, so I arranged that song for Korean kaigum mm -hmm. as well. So first it was with my lute, and then I put it onto Korean kaigum, and uh, and then that piece. There's a scarf over my face, which was. I think Garin's idea, you know, to use the scarf. The scarf is a, a Javanese slendang. It's a red. It's a scarf that they use in Japanese dance. And but to use it as a mask, and then that can symbolize, you know, maybe uh, women being hidden in in society in many different communities and uh, commentary, critic critique of that. And so you know, Garin was just. It was the first time I'd ever worked with a director, and, and, and then I realized, woo, this is an important process because they can see this big picture yeah. thing, they see, see things that you don't see, or maybe even abilities that you have that you don't even know that you have. So yeah. he, he really brought that out, like the storytelling aspect. I always thought of myself as a terrible storyteller, and, 
And uh, so we actually scripted this part in the middle where I, I tell the story of, of this Pansori tale. We scripted it at first because I felt so awkward, you know. So it began with like, I spent the last 10 years, you know. At first it was like that, but then with each performance it became so natural. And I felt like, wow, it's so easy for me now to talk to audiences and yeah. just to be myself. But that was something that developed because of something God in kind of set up at first. So leap of faith. You know? Absolutely. <laughs> so you so. mentioned just now two of the instruments you play yes. in the piece. Yes. I know there's a big list. What else are you, are you playing? Ah, let's see. Uh, so there's Taiwanese moon lute, uh, the Korean kayagum, and then piano, and, and then a lot of percussion instruments. So the guengari from uh, Korea, uh, and then this uh, instrument called kamanak from Java, which is this like kind of dolphin-shaped instrument, um, and then these um, Vietnamese sticks, which is a tradition that I have yet to really learn, but I, I've, I've learned one a little bit from, and then the, like, so along my travels, you know, I've learned the value of just taking advantage of being at a certain place at a certain time. So I was able to be in Vietnam for a Fulbright kind of, what is it, Southeast Asia conference. And while I was there, we only had four days there, but I thought, you know, I'm gonna try and do stuff here, do some research. And through connections, Fulbright connections, I was able to meet a master singer of their version of the moon guitar, uh, who sadly passed away. His name was Kim Sing, very famous. Uh, player and singer, folk singer from Vietnam, and then able to learn a little bit of katu, which is spelled, um, well, in romanization, C-A and then T-R-U. It's a tradition mainly sung by women, actually only sung by women, I think. And, uh, and so I befriended this young master of this tradition and uh, got one lesson from her. And it was just, you know, it's kind of like, well, this, it's like, it's to save, you know, and this is for the future. I'm going to come back to this tradition, learn Vietnamese. You know? Amazing. <laughs> so, you know, but those opportunities, you have to grab them. And uh, because that five minutes can become a life-changing one year, two years. So that happened with Korea as well. So I really believe in seizing the moment, seizing uh, the opportunity to be with someone for just a minute, you know? Absolutely. It really matters. So through all yeah. your traveling and all your yeah. studies, you managed to just accumulate all the skills and all these instruments. Well, it's, I, I want to say it is accumulation, as I said, but it's just like a beginning. It's like a tip of the iceberg. Because these are like traditions that are lifelong traditions that... One can never master, even if you just focused on that one thing. So yeah. I don't pretend to learn, you know, master a tradition. It's it's just a beginning. Yeah. That's the way I feel, that it's a humble beginning and then a journey, you know. As a creative artist, it's um, just a humble touching of the, yeah. the, the on, upon that tradition and then... Uh, with the goal of going deeper and deeper and deeper, but it's never ending. Yeah. So, in the program note for this piece, mm -hmm. um, it talks about the close bond between tradition and modernity. Yeah. And that's really important for you and your work. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe you can talk about that a little bit more and how do those two right. meet and become something? Well, I think it's uh, oftentimes when you look at, like, if you're witnessing this ancient ceremony. Um, for instance, this, this uh, tradition called Donghe uh, Angyoshingut in Korea, which I'm obsessed with, and it's East Coast Shaman, uh, how would you say, ceremony. <laughs> uh, and, and these are, you know, they can be 24 hours long, they can be three days long, uh, you know, 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. or 11 p.m., five days long. So it's, um, I've, have been so lucky to be cl become close with a family um, whom Simon Barker introduced me to, who's a great drummer from Australia, jazz drummer. And, uh, and he's done his you know, research himself on Korean traditional music. And so, so when I met this family, you know, I immediately just was just wowed by the multiple layers of, of what they do. You know, it's a it serves a function in the community 
It's uh, the, the community is completely involved. There's no line between this very kind of sacred ceremony with very exact musical and dance and visual elements, like very exact. And then, but then they'll just sit down and have a drink, you know, of this strange, kind of like Red Bull that they drink. Not healthy, but it's like, <laughs> it keeps them going for like all day and all. But they drink it and, uh, and then they just sit down and be like, yeah. And so there's no boundaries. Mm -hmm. There's no, it's just all one. And then, and then the, the community, um, you know, the ladies, and they'll, they'll come up and they'll dance, you know, and, they'll, and then uh, they'll give money to the singers because that's a, a way of showing appreciation and admiration. And they, they just collect them in their, <laughs> in this part of their costume. And so this kind of, so much going on and dance and the fan and storytelling and talking and, and improvising. And just, uh, you know, so what's amazing is the singer is standing here and the drummer is facing her. And, and there's this uh, paper with all these Korean names on it. And it's names from the community and they'll improvise with this set form, but they'll just be like, and then like, but they're improvising with the names, fitting it in. And it's so complex. And the gongs you can't follow at all you know unless you have studied for because it's it's so mystical and and it's all happening and it's all real and it, it's for this community for this fishing village for a better harvest and you know so when you're witnessing that it's so mo like modern because mm -hmm. it's just so authentic and then but it's so ancient at the same time so that's that's what I mean. It's it's just so relevant and just things you've never heard before, never seen before, and it's it. But this has been going on for generations and generations, and so that is. Uh, so you really don't know. Like I think a compliment that I get from people, my high, the highest compliment is when they can't tell whether something's traditional or modern that mm. I'm doing. It's like it feels traditional, but then there's it's something I've never seen before. So what, you know? So that's. That's a huge compliment. That sounds incredible. Yeah.